gentlemen, would you please go crazy all over again and welcome to the stage Mike Gorswelly! Like this. Yeah. Yes. Right at the back. Okay, we don't need this then. Let's put that to the side. I'm going to do this in two parts. So, first part is going to be a poem. Then, the second part, I'm going to proselytize about open data. Now, um, before I got into the science of open data and science policy, I was an animal behavior scientist. <laughs> and so, this poem is a tribute to that and also a tribute to David Attenborough because I love the way. And the lighting's perfect. The way he goes into woodlands, crouches down, and then starts telling you about the lives of little animals that live in there, and draws you into the story. So this is called The Shrew. To the undiscerning eye, it is a mouse that scuttles by. But I hasten to inform you that you may have seen a shrew. <laughs> now, how does one know if one is looking at a shrew? Well, yes, I am an expert, but you can do it too. You see, there is one distinctive feature of this endearing little creature. The shrew has a long and wiggly nose. And I don't suppose this audience knows why the shrew grows such an elongated nose. Well, I shall tell you. You see, when it is snuffling and shuffling through the leaves, it makes a rustling, which is all the insects bustling for anywhere to hide. And a crack, crevice, or hole seems a pretty safe goal to an insect's very simple eye. However, the shrewd shrew nose that his clever flexy nose will get each little one by surprise. Everyone say, that's amazing! That's amazing! Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, without one jot of concern, the shrew will now approach each hiding place in turn. It will step up to the target and push in its nose and push it and push it as far as it goes. Now the shrew's nose can handle any bend. And the other design feature are the whiskers on the end. These whiskers are not short and sharp and prickling, but rather they are feather soft and perfect for tickling. <laughs> Tickle them it does, up and down and round. It tickles all those little bugs hiding in the ground. Now what good does that do, you may wish to ask me? Well, the shrew is a master of insect psychology. You see, a cornered insect, when tickled by a snout, obviously, desperately, wishes to get out. It is giggling and it is wriggling when it thinks it sees a gap, so it goes running out under the nose, chomp, straight into the shrew mouth trap. Everyone say, oh no, the shrew mouth trap. Oh no, the shrew mouth trap. Yes, <laughs> I'm afraid so. <laughs> True mouth trap. However, is this really why the shrew's nose is so? Well, I could say yes, but I should not profess to know. You see, I'm a scientist. My conclusions must be dreary, and I must categorically state that this is merely, only, just a theory. <laughs> Nevertheless, I do wish to stress that I presented you with a very highly educated guest. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, this is the serious, the educational part. Um, and it's, it's really important though because there are big, big changes happening in science. It's something of a revolution because we're starting to do science differently. Um, and I'm going to explain why this is important and then also how it's actually going to happen. So first up, some of you might have heard of open access, right? Making the results of scientific research freely and readily accessible to everyone, scientists and public included. Well, by the results of research, what we really mean is the academic papers. And by academic papers, what we really mean is that which the scientists choose to write about after having collected their data and analyzed it. And herein lies a problem. Because oftentimes, many times, scientists will only publish on little slivers of all the information they've collected, or they might not publish at all uh, on one study. Myself and a bunch of colleagues, we analyzed some six billion euros worth of European funding going into health-related projects, and found that half of those did not produce uh, papers that could be traced via Google Scholar or via PubMed. And uh, it tended to be the bigger studies that actually did, 
But nevertheless, this 50% figure has been found elsewhere. Big studies looking at the number of conference uh, presentations going through to full publications finds a similar 50% figure. And also with clinical trials data, up to about 50% get swept under the rug because they don't like what they're seeing. Now, the answer to this is clearly making the databases available. If you don't like the data you have, and so it isn't in your benefit to write it up, or if you don't have time to, at least it should be made available for other people to do that with. Because if you don't, you have this scenario whereby the science data that we have out there to read and discuss is very different from that which we collect. It's different from reality. So it is a massive problem. Now, why isn't that happening that scientists aren't putting it out? Well, first of all, <laughs> first of all, it was thought, poor darlings, um, they don't know how to, they've got it on their computer, you know, they don't have a personal website, so what are they going to do? So some universities went along and said, we will make you grand data archives to deposit your stuff in. And they did. And they said, come scientists, share your data. And they didn't. <laughs> and they just had a whole load of excuses. So then people started saying, why is this? And they started surveying the scientists about their attitudes towards open data. And everyone said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm a believer, I'm, I'm with you, open data, that's the way forward, that's how it's going to have to be, yeah, sure. Um, let other people do it first, because I have some apprehensions. And these apprehensions generally are, one, when you put data out there, other people can analyze your data, and there's always going to be someone who's better at doing it than you. <laughs> and that's somewhat uncomfortable. They can really show you up, and also if you mess up, and then it's out there, and people demonstrate that clearly. There was an example recently. Does anyone know about this economics paper? It was one of the cornerstones of the austerity policies across the globe. And then a student said, oh, it's part of my course. I'd like to replicate what you did. And, they, and finally managed to get the data from them, analyze it, couldn't replicate it. And it was found out that the original researchers actually had not added up an Excel column correctly. <laughs> they hadn't highlighted it all the way to the top. <laughs> and this was all through the news. Now, that's embarrassing. But it's important. That's why open data is important, but it's also really um, new territory for lots of people. Another problem could be that what about if someone else goes and messes up with your data and says that that's what your data says and you say no it doesn't, you have to get involved with them, or they want to share your data and you don't want to bother with them. So, um, and also for public health data, there's a particular risk that you can't actually have patient data out there. So, in the last minute, here are the three ways that it's going to get fixed so that we can actually have this open data vision. And it is follows. Firstly, funders have to demand it, and they are starting to do that. First in the States, now Research Councils UK, they're saying we will only give you money if you make that data available. Secondly, they're going to have to help scientists in this brave new territory by giving them the legal advice, telling them about repositories that they can put their data. And thirdly, it needs to be incentivized for scientists. So first of all, you can simply make these databases citable with a unique code and then, just like they collect their Citation Council papers, they can do the same thing with databases. And you can even have now data papers, which are basically how-to manuals associated with these databases, so that people can go and analyze the data without pestering the original scientists. And that is the end. Thank you.